New Directions in Psychohistory and Psychobiography. I take tips. And it features myself. Um, I'm Kent Teaksman. I was Professor Emeritus at the University of Connecticut, President of the IPA, and was drawn into psychohistory by Paul Lelovitz. And we also have Irene Jabers, who is at Yeshiva University, is also a counselor in private practice. And she'll be also presenting on this uh, similar subject. And I'm going to go first. Four score and seven years ago. Oh, well, that's the wrong speech. <laughs> Psychohistory is like Rodney Dangerfield. It gets no respect. As one of the field's earliest champions, Bruce Bachelors, says, it has fallen into somewhat extended disrepute. Historian Michael Roth, also president of Wesleyan University, writes, psychohistory in the United States seemed to many a crude application of Freud. The logic was often faulty, the research thin, and the anachronisms heavy. In Google Books, since 1999, there are eight books listed with psychohistory in the title, three of them by academic historians, one of them sitting here. And one of those was a reprint with a new preface of a book published in 1990. In the same period, 26 books with political psychology as part of the title have been published. So few members of the American Historical Association identify themselves as psychohistorians that the field is no longer in, on the association's list of recognized specialty. Not surprisingly, there are no faculty positions designated in psychohistory in major universities in the United States. Historians, at least, went through a period where psychohistory was hotly debated, not so in academic psychology. Except for psychobiography in the last 30 years, psychohistory has generally been ignored in academic psychology. Uh, an exception is Dean Keith Simonton, who thinks psychoanalytic psychohistorians make precarious extrapolations from clinical to historical settings, and that psycho psychohistory may lack the rigor to qualify as a psychological science. Even though most of academia shuns the term psychohistory, some scholars connect psychology and history. Richard Hofstetter and the American political tradition and the paranoid spell in American politics is one. Columbia University, Peter Gay, when asked by Paul Elevitz um, for his credit card, um, said, asked he's a psychohistorian, said, no, I'm a historian. I'm a historian who uses psychoanalysis. Historian Judith Hughes uses the term psychological history. The aforementioned Dean Keith Simonton characterizes his approach as psychology of history. Lynn Hunt writes about psychosocial history. Historians Lindell Roper and Joan Scott discuss the role of fantasy within history. One could say psychohistory is dead, long live psychological history or some other nom de plume, or psychohistory is alive and well, but living under an alias. The inevitable intersection of psychology and history sneaks in the back door, no matter what, if any, name it is called. As Peter Gay wrote, the historian is an amateur psychologist. Historians attribute motives, study passions, and analyze irrationality. Psychology is an inevitable component of historical writing. And some of the most important issues in history cannot be adequately addressed without psychology. Psychohistory has not always itself reached some of its potential. It's sometimes seen the subject matter more narrow than it needs be. Lloyd DeMoss, one of the founders of contemporary psychohistory, says that it includes childhood, psychobiography, group psychology. Elevitz writes that this field studies psychobiography, childhood group dynamics, mechanisms of defense, dreams, and creativity. 
including creativity, and his list is very important. Because what history entails has often been taken for granted within psycho history. For the longest time, history was conceived of as beginning when written documents started to exist. Anything <coughs> before that was called prehistory. This conception has been altering recently. One of the newer approaches is called big history, which begins when the universe starts <laughs> at the first Jewish deli. <laughs> the world is over 13 billion years old, and the existence of the predecessors of humans starts about two and a half million years ago. So most of what's big history doesn't really apply to psychohistory, can't be included in that. Then there's something called deep history, and that begins, covers the whole of human existence and our predecessors, so that goes back, as I said, about two and a half million years. And once we start to look at the whole history of the genus Homo, then the subject matter of both history and psychohistory change. Another trend is what is called global or world history, and that became prominent about 30 years ago. So instead of having history courses that serve history of Western Civ, they're mostly often been replaced or supplemented by world history. Global history, which could almost be exchanged for world history, um, that is what there's a topic that's discussed. It's not discussed just in a locality, but on the whole planet. So big history, deep history, global history have opened up wider horizons for the historical discipline. What's called the long durée, as opposed to specialties in short subject areas, brief subject areas. So deep history is the one that most ex applies to psychohistory, though only a, a brief element within, within deep history. Um, and so it's about 200, 300,000 years ago that Homo sapiens existed. For, came into existence, but at least 95% of our time on this planet was spent as foragers and hunters. Only in the last 10, 12,000 years did some ingenious humans invent agriculture, and then the changes began that have led to our ever-accelerating path. After agriculture, we started living in permanent villages, then larger settlements, then government, civilization, technology, literacy, expanded commerce, nation states, empires, modern science, industry, more technology, medicine, landing on the moon, a global economy, worldwide communication in an instant. Over the relatively short period of time, there's been a revolutionary transformation of the very conditions of being human. In examining this short period, the astonishing inventiveness and the multiplicity of forms of human creativity stand out. We cannot understand what it is to be human without examining the full range of creativity over time and in the evolution of our species. While creativity is studied in a variety of academic disciplines, a major home base is psychology. Historians then need the findings of psychology to do justice to the role of creativity in our past and present. A psychology, psychologically informed history is indispensable in conceiving, researching, and writing about human change since farming began. The intersection of psychology and history would then move from the fringes to the very center of the historical discipline. It is the practicality and inventiveness of human creativity that has been indispensable in our existence. Our innovativeness <laughs> builds on our cognitive, linguistic, emotional, social, cultural, individuated capacities. To be true to the subject matter of history and psychohistory, we must more fully explore the dimensions of human creativity within the unfolding of history. So psychological researchers into creativity find that it usually takes about a decade before someone develops innovations. And 
So you need to be immersed in your subject matter first. You have to have an effect, an apprenticeship period. And you usually do so in an existing field that you learn from. But then those fields are highly dependent on the level of cultural development that a civilization has. So when hunters were, when humans were hunters and foragers, the kind of creativity that could be developed were of a different magnitude than when Galileo could improve on telescopes and look closer at the, at the solar system. So we can never understand the context in which creativity develops without understanding developments within culture. Self-actualization cannot occur without cultural actualization. Yet it turns out that scholarship on creativity explaining human evolution by historians and psychohistorians is much less frequent than psychological and psychoanalytic writings on creativity. Similarly, the history of emotions is becoming a more active specialty, but not as prevalent as the psychology of emotions. Individuation, self-actualization, social evolution are again more studied as distinct subject matters by fields other than history. Creativity is a phenomenon that has many dimensions. So for psychohistory and history to explore this, we need to say what are these, some of these different domains. And the precondition for our creativity is that imagination and intellect are part of our mental capacity. Humans have developed certain mental traits before major creativity creative innovations occurred. What took us so long to develop agriculture? And then literacy, reading and writing. It's 5,000 years old and we're 250,000 years old. So these are major questions for deep history. And I, as I always say, what would have happened to the talents of Beethoven, Einstein, or Hitler? when the career fields were confined to hunting, foraging, and parenting. Creativity appears in a number of different domains. So I'm going to list what I think are as many of the domains of creativity that relate to history as I can think of. Thinking. Through ideas, our species seeks to make sense of things. Our creativity has been manifest in belief systems as far as can be traced. We are idea-centered beings. Arts, painting, music, dance, go back at least 70,000 years. Technology, homo sapiens would not have advanced to our current state without extraordinary technological innovations that today boggle the mind. Without technology, we'll still be hunting and foraging and we wouldn't be here. Period. Killing. As with many species, in surviving by killing plants and animals for food is, an, is necessary for human existence, as well as warding off the lethal desires of other predators. Humans have produced, been more adept and versatile at killing than any other species on our planet. Of course, this creativity has led us to the point of having weapons and means of delivery that can end life on this planet. Agriculture, this is indispensable. We wouldn't be able to have the Industrial Revolution if we didn't have the Agricultural Revolution. We wouldn't have the food that would support our urban lifestyles. And it is this change to agriculture that marks the revolution in human existence. Commerce, trade. You have to be able to bring your goods, your ideas, whatever, somewhere else besides where you reside. So this has also been indispensable, and it and we. So this is important and creative social organization. There are arts and skills 
to be able to have us live together with as many people as we have. We need organization and society and means of getting people to identify with a larger group. Just think how large this country is. Over, you know, over 3,000 miles just on the continental United States. And somehow, despite it all, we have been able to find ways of having an American identity as diverse and contradictory as it can be. And reading and writing is another element in creativity. Um, and I'm still astounded that it's only been 5,000 years since we've been doing this. Literature is an outgrowth of our literacy. And certainly, the written language has, and in all sorts of poems, plays, novels, and in the literary forms, is one of the peaks of human creativity. Science. I don't need to say much more about that. Um, and lastly, genius. Somehow, within humans, there is this capacity for extraordinary innovation, creativity, that goes beyond just the normal creativity and becomes exceptional. And if you ask who are geniuses, the mo who's the most recognized name is usually Einstein, who was considered that, who at the age of 25 wrote three articles that revolutionized the name physics. There may be other domains of creativity that I've missed. But we also need to trace the peaks and valleys of creativity within historical development. We need to pinpoint what may be among the most creative civilizations in history and discuss how they develop, what has led to their being so creative, what has enabled them to sustain it when they have, and what has led them to be less creative. How creativity and genius develops in individuals within history and culture is an integral part of the investigation of deep history. So we need to understand the domains of creativity, but also where greatness in human life and human creativity has emerged and emerged in certain times and cultures. There have been notable and not so notable attempts to look at the full scope of human history and understand the dynamics of creative achievement. <laughs> Among others, the work of Hegel and Marx, both Karl and Groucho. <laughs> um, I, I don't know if any of you are familiar with sociologist Pitchum Sorokin. In the late 30s and early 40s, he wrote a four volumes on cultural and social dynamics. Howard may recognize, will surely name the name of Alfred Kroeber, whose 1944 configurations of culture growth is maybe one of the first attempts to figure these dilemmas out. Dean Keith Simonton, I've mentioned a couple of times, wrote a book called Greatness um, and has published in Clio's. There are various books by Jared, didn't he? Didn't he publish? I thought you said he did. Oh, he, he, not, he didn't publish greatness in Cleo. Oh, no. He didn't publish, yes. Uh, but, but, but he had the greatness to realize he should publish the book. Right. <laughs> Various books by Jared Diamond. There's a journalist named Peter Watson who has a book called Ideas, A History of Thought and Invention from Fire to Freud. Among the less notable is the controversial political scientist Charles Murray, most famous for the bell curve. But he has also published a magnum opus called Human Accomplishment, the Pursuit of Excellence in the Arts and Scientists. And recently, there's another anthropologist named Augustine Fuentes, who has a book called The Creative Spark, How Imagination Made Humans Exceptional. It is evident that the interconnection of psychology and history are essential for understanding the place of creativity in the evolution of humans. An expanded domain for psychohistory is integral to the discipline of history. We cannot do justice to our past without mastering how the many domains of creativity have shaped the various stages of humanity's 
evolution. In other words, we cannot come to terms with their long history without the fruits of psychohistorical scholarship. Psychohistory is often either ignored, disparaged, or given other names. Yet whatever it may be called, the intersection of psychology and history is central to the historical enterprise and understanding what it means to be human. for psychohistorians and psychobiographers. Um, it's a rather long paper, but let's see if I can get it in the 24th as we lie at each other. Um, I have been concerned that the disciplines of psychohistory and psychobiography have been entrenched in narratives that place too much emphasis on individual and societal psychopathologies. There has not been adequate discussion or focus on contemporary narratives that are concerned with multiculturalism, diversity, and intersectionality, which I will define later, as well as the effects of institutionalized racism, sexism, homo prejudice, class bias, and ageism in the individual and collective psyche. My goal is to raise awareness of these challenges and to pose new questions for psychohistorians and psychobiographers to consider when engaged in their research and projects. My backstory. For most of my adult life, I've been engaged in activist politics as well as interested in the nature of consciousness. I have pursued these interests through academic study, degrees in history, philosophy, and clinical practice for the past 35 years. A focal point of interest for me is the relationship between the individual psyche and society. Both for the individual and society, emotions and thoughts are often muddled, confused, and in conflict. Simply put, we barely know what we are about or what we are doing moment to moment. We are often triggered by external factors and we react without thinking. Then the mess begins. Early on in my clinical training, I was introduced to the work of the sociologist C. Wright Mills, specifically his the sociological imagination. Mills writes, quote, the sociological imagination enables us to grasp history and biography and the relations between the two within society, unquote. This observation opens the door to greater understanding not just about the individual, but also the historical moment in which the individual lives. Mills challenges us to direct our focus away from the idea of the individual psyche as developing separately from larger societal forces and suggests that we develop within an historical context an environment filled with rules, roles, prejudices, biases, institutions, etc. Russell Jacoby, in his The Repression of Psychoanalysis, Otto Fenichel and the Political Freudians, introduces us to the early work of the political Freudians, such as Fenichel. Jac Jacoby suggests that the root of the ideas of the political Freudians can be found within Freud's essay, Civilized Sexual Morality and Modern Nervousness. Freud comes forward with ideas to reform society's repression of sexuality, especially for women. In 1918, Freud lectured about how, quote, the large masses of people suffer with neurosis from society's repressions and that the poor man has just as much right to help for his mind, unquote. Out of this came the establishment of many free clinics. Otto Fenichel took psychoanalysis into a more politically radical direction. Jacobi maintains that Fenichel was quote unquote, unambiguously devoted to a political psychoanalysis. 
According to Jacoby, in 1931, Fenichel's outline of clinical psychoanalysis posited that, quote, it is false and dangerous to believe that neurosis originates in the biological situation of the child, not the Oedipus complex itself, but specific experiences give rise to neurosis, and these experiences rest on historical basis, for example, the conduct of parents and teachers. These ideas provide the groundwork <coughs> for the need for the addition of a sociological perspective in order to gain a fuller understanding of the individual. This removes the neurosis from the category of an individual's medical diagnostic issue and into an historical context concerned with environmental and social political challenges on the individual. Jacobi also discusses the work of Wilhelm Reich, especially during the time he was in Vienna, 1924 to 1930, and led a seminar with the approval of Freud on therapy. In 1933, he published Character Analysis, where he outlines his theory of body armor <coughs> and social repression. From the 1930s onward, he attempted to reconcile Marxism with psychoanalysis. Additionally, he and several others, left-leaning colleagues, opened in Vienna the Socialist Society for Sexual Advice and Sexual Research. From these readings, I realized that to more fully comprehend an individual, as well as a society, one needs to understand the social realities as well as the individual's realities. Out of this realization, I took these ideas into the classroom as well as into the consulting room in order to explore how they may play out in real time. What would the challenges be? What new questions and ideas might emerge that could be used in the fields of psychohistory and psychobiography in the classroom? I teach graduate classes in multicultural and diversity counseling, as well as sexuality and gender counseling in the mental health counseling program at Fearcuff Graduate School of Psychology, Yeshiva University. Both courses are designed to increase student awareness of the relationship between psyche and culture. We study race, ethnicity, class, age, gender, sexuality, disability, religion, ethnicity, and the counseling process. We focus on identity development within the context of specific cultures and how individuals navigate their lives, balancing their familial cultural backgrounds within American society. The curriculum for the sexuality and gender counseling course includes the historic backstory for the treatment of LGBTQ, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer individuals by the mental health professions, as well as an in-depth discussion of current research and counseling theories. Of particular importance, we discuss LGBTQ identity development within the context of the experience of living in a homo-prejudiced society. The clinical component for both classes is fulfilled by the use of memoirs, wherein the subject of the memoir becomes the designated client for the class. This ensures that all the students are working with the same client at the same time. The challenges that arise in teaching either course involve helping students deal with their own biases, prejudices, counter-transferential issues with materials and subjects that arise during class discussions. For example, in the multicultural and diversity class, many students were reluctant to discuss issues involving race because they feared that they would be seen as politically incorrect. The issue also came up when a male student used the term, quote unquote, man up, in discussing gender and sexuality. Several students became angry and interpreted the term as anti-gay. This led to a lengthy discussion about political correctness and how this has a repressive function. We then discussed how this repression affects an individual and what resultant defenses might develop. Out of this discussion, we delved into how institutional racism, sexism, homo-prejudice, ageism, 
religious and class biases affect the development of an individual's defense system, wherein the defense becomes egocentric and part of the personality structure. This led to further discussion regarding the counseling process with the client who absorbed so much outside narrative that they, highly differ, that they hardly differentiate their individual experience from the external world's biases and prejudices. In the sexuality and gender counseling class, many of the same issues arose as well. However, a major focus of this course involved the fact that politicians and religious leaders openly display anti-LGBTQ bias and prejudice, which only serves to reinforce and validate long-held stereotypes. Also, the reoccurring threat of a return to conversion therapy to straighten out LGBTQ individuals demonstrates the level of intolerance for differences prevalent in certain sectors of our society today. When working with an individual who is dealing with their sexuality or agenda, the counselor must be aware of these very real external variables of this individual's life. Additionally, many, additionally, unlike many other minority groups, the LGBTQ individual may not receive support from their family. In fact, they may be exiled from their family. In this class, there is a lot of discussion about the need for safe zones, where people can talk about the sexuality, definitions of microaggressions, which is a comment or action directed at a minority member or a, a, of a majority group that is often unintentional or an unconscious that reinforces a stereotype. And that's defined by Daryl Wing Sue. And intersectionality, the overlapping of interse intersecting of social characterizations, class, gender, race, etc., as they apply to an individual or group in relationship to institutional systems of domination and oppression. Out of an understanding of all these social components, we then focus on the internalization by the individual and the resultant meaning making that happens. What defenses emerge, or to use the term coined by Wilhelm Reich, what armoring? From these, teaching these courses, I have come to a greater understanding of the importance of the interface of the individual's internal realities and the ongoing social realities. I have brought this awareness into my work as a therapist and learned how these variables play out in the consulting room as well as in the classroom. In the consulting room. A 60-year-old gay Caucasian client describes the following incident in our session. He is walking down the street in Tribeca of Manhattan and coming toward him is a well-dressed 20-something African-American woman having a relationship with her smartphone, totally unaware of the world around her. She walks within a hair's breadth of him and he puts out his hand to prevent her from walking into him. She stops and screams at him, quote, take your hand off me, white bastard, unquote. She then calmly goes back to her phone and walks on. He comes to session the next day and relates the story with tears in his eyes and says, quote, I marched with Martin Luther King and spent a summer in the South organizing. What did I do? She hates me because I am white. I am so fed up with this political correctness. I've had it. In this single anecdote, we are challenged to look at a cross-section of challenging societal and personal issues. The intersectionality of my client's identity, white, gay, target of prior gay bashing incidents where he was nearly killed, rejected by his alcoholic mother because he is gay, and the loss of an entire cohort of friends to AIDS. The African-American woman, filled with rage, <coughs> is a result of who knows what personal, racial, or gender-related traumas she has lived through. Both are members of minorities who have suffered from institutionalized hate, yet they have become stereotypes to each other. 
him the powerful white man and she the African-American woman using political correctness as a weapon and defense. My client spent many sessions focusing on his feelings about this incident. Out of this work, he came to realize that his need to do good in the world, fight for the rights of others, came from his deep-seated desire that one day all those he fought for would stand up for him. When this young woman attacked him, he felt totally betrayed. After a lot of work, he came to realize that his internalized hatred of himself for, for being gay prevented him from joining other gay activists. After a lifetime of hiding behind other causes, he embraced his own. Here we see how intersectionality operates in real time and not as some abstract concept. This shows how social inequality is a multi-layered experience consisting of several forms of discrimination happening all at the same time. Do ask, do tell, questions in new directions.